As we begin, I believe you have a statement to read into the record. This is J. Robert Oppenheimer. Pete J. Robert Oppenheimer. Throughout the film, he gets visions of the atomic world, of the possibility of physics and the power it could wield. What's the J stand for? Nothing. And he's excited by these opportunities. I hear you want to start a school of quantum theory. I am starting it next door. We get shots like this that visualize these abstract concepts. Oppenheimer sees things in sort of different dimensions. But after he's made the bomb, his mindset changes. I feel that I have blood on my hands. Instead of visions of hidden atomic worlds, we get visions of nuclear warfare. Oppenheimer is no longer fascinated by the power of physics, but horrified by it, because he himself has unleashed it upon humanity. He changed the world forever. We live in a world of his, his creation. His very perception of reality has been changed and destroyed by what he has created. We go from seeing stuff like this, to stuff like this. The film begins with him looking into the raindrops, and we end with this same image. We thought we might start a chain reaction that would destroy the entire world. Only now, it takes on an entirely different meaning. I believe we did. Oppenheimer is a long film. One hour, you and me. With a lot of information. Not kilotons, but megatons. A lot of characters. Dr. Lawrence. Dr. Hopkins Chevalier. Mr. Lomelitz. This is my little brother, Frank. And a lot of plot points. Well, I've only read the transcripts. The challenge was that there's so much information and so many different timelines and things going on. But despite this, we never lose track of what's happening. And how do you get that done in three hours and not make it feel rushed or too slow? We never lose focus from scene to scene. It's paradoxical, and yet, it works. And how does Christopher Nolan and editor Jennifer Lame do this? Well, let's take a look at this scene. This is German you have to seek out. Heisenberg. Right. One might be led to the We know where the characters are and who this new character is, simply because we get a line of dialogue that telegraphs what the next scene will be about. This is German you have to seek out. And this isn't the only example. How about we leave it with something new? They're talking about a hydrogen bomb in this scene. Instead of uranium or plutonium. We used hydrogen. And in the next scene, they're talking about it too. And one of them was the need for an H-bomb program. Here they're talking about Oppenheimer meeting with some generals. You're meeting the Secretary of War. And in the next scene, he's doing just that. A pillar of fire, 10,000 feet tall. This is just one way the film keeps its focus and maintains a fast pace. But when I first read the script, it felt like five minutes, you know, I just ripped through it. It makes a three hour movie where almost every scene is just people talking to each other into one of the most intense and engaging films of the year. Say, no, we cannot go down this road, even as he knew. We'd have to. And I think that while I was working on the film, I just kept going back to wanting the audience to feel the same way I did when I read that script. We set forth our... Oh, no, you, 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 you. I'm asking you. I we, you. And today, we're going to talk about how the editing makes all of this possible. It's so propulsive. You almost don't have time to take breath. You feel completely altered. It's a profoundly moving and overwhelming experience watching it. Right now, in Hollywood, it seems there's a trend for long films. Do you want to go home right now? Even big blockbusters seem longer than ever, with the latest Indiana Jones, Mission Impossible and John Wick all clocking in at over two and a half hours. Thanks for putting up with me. Like it or not, some of the biggest films releasing today are some of the longest films. You'll be slow in the water. Scorsese uses the long runtime of Killers of the Flower Moon to tell a sweeping story rich with historical detail. Why we put our children here is because Mother Earth allowed us here. Films like Dune and Avatar 2 use their extended runtime to create intricate and captivating story worlds. Teach them our ways so they do not suffer the shame of being useless. And Oppenheimer uses its three hour runtime to tell a relentless fast paced story that's simultaneously intimate and character driven Don't take out the sheets. and monumental in scale. It's packed with information, characters, plot points and themes, Near zero. yet it doesn't seem muddled. Excuse me gentlemen if I become stirred, but I am. Its focus is precise Fun. and its story is coherent. You are an American. Prometheus. And despite jumping around multiple different timelines, we never lose track of where we are or what we're talking about. It is a massive story and it's got the cast of Ben-Hur and it spans decades by the end when all the elements that have been set up come together in this kind of symphonic trinity. You told me I'd be okay. You kind of have been guided along so you can fully experience the emotional value of it. Dr. Alpenheim. It's an honor. What's unique about Oppenheimer is how short the scenes are. I didn't expect to see you today. There's usually just a few lines of dialogue. Oh, I have to make an appointment. And then we move on. The first sequence is Oppenheimer's time at Cambridge. It establishes that he's a gifted scientist. You're at my lecture. You ask the only good question. But not exactly mentally stable. 
We begin with Oppenheimer in bed, then in the lab where he poisons the apple, then he goes to a lecture, now he's back in bed, before he rushes back to the lab to get rid of the apple. Where am I? Then we get a montage, which is loud, fast-paced and visually striking. It serves as sort of a climax to the sequence. For example, the Can You Hear The Music montage. We worked on that constantly. This pattern repeats itself across the film. I have to get back to America. Why? With longer sequences comprised of very short scenes that flow into one another. There's no one there taking quantum mechanics seriously. Before we return to another timeline, which links back to what we've just seen. Did you ever encounter Heisenberg again? Yeah. This ensures that no scene is too drawn out. We don't linger in one place for too long, keeping the pacing quick. Build them a town. Fast. And the storytelling cinematic. And you know explosives better than anyone in the world. But these sequences are also self-contained. I wanted to give you a heads up on a, on a man named... Eltonton. Setting up and resolving plot threads within the same sequence. So Eltonton made his approach through a member of the faculty here. Oppenheimer poisons the apple, and then he's reminded of this during his dream, and then the sequence ends with him throwing the apple away. Where am I? Sometimes sequences start and end on the same line of dialogue. Who'd want to justify their whole life? Who'd want to justify their whole life? Throughout the film, lines are repeated and given new meanings. Theory will get you only so far. Theory will take you only so far. Theory will take you only so far. Eat. Eat. I thought if I could find a way to combine physics and New Mexico, my life would be perfect. Physics and New Mexico, huh? These small callbacks are satisfying. No burden of proof. No burden of proof. And make the film seem more connected and fought out. Why get caught holding the knife yourself? What was it you said about Borden? Why get caught holding the knife yourself? And there's a precise rhythm to this dialogue. Ownership is theft. Property. Property? Property, not ownership. I'm sorry, I read it in the original German. <laughs> And these sequences are also very focused. He seemed more focused on heavy water. Everything contributes in some way to the larger narrative or themes. Act 1 is about Oppenheimer's relationships, his interest in communism, and the advancement of physics. These fission pulses, they're massive. And every sequence is about one or all of these themes. This one begins at a communist gathering. But I hadn't heard you were a party member. He talks to Chevalier about physics. What happens to stars when they die? Then he meets Florence Pugh. MGM. They sleep together, and he gives his infamous quote, now I am become death. which in our minds links to physics and the power of atomic weapons. Destroyer of worlds. This sequence never gets distracted from the key themes of the first act. Teachers are unionized. Why not professors? There's also some kind of connective tissue between each scene, like when Strauss is talking about the FBI taking license plates outside of a communist meeting. The FBI was taking license plates outside suspected communist gatherings, and his name popped up. And then we cut to the FBI taking license plates outside of a communist meeting. But it can also be more subtle, like thematic links in the dialogue. He was founder, mayor, sheriff. All it needs is a saloon. They can even use music to mark a transition. Can you hear the music, Robert? Yes, I can. The film is dense with information and characters. William Borden, Joint Committee on Atomic Energy. But we don't have to remember every small detail. Oh, yes. In editing the film like this, the information kind of washes over us. It's no longer the enemy who are the greatest threat to mankind. It's our work. It's not essential to take in all of this information. One night, I saw a V2 rocket headed England. But we still feel its effect. They won't fear it until they understand it. But imagine what it will be for such an enemy rocket to carry an atomic warhead. But for when Nolan wants us to remember specific characters or plot points, we're given helpful reminders. Like when Oppenheimer is being recruited by Matt Damon. Colonel Groves, this is Lieutenant Colonel Nichols. Have that dry clean. They talk about Heisenberg, a character we saw briefly about an hour ago. This is German you have to seek out. Chances are, most people wouldn't remember him by his name. Who do you think they put in charge? Werner Heisenberg. So we're shown this quick cutaway. You know his work. I know him. And this isn't the only example. How was Mr. Borden able to put together such a detailed indictment? Patrick Blackett. Oppenheimer has a lot of characters. It'd be impossible to remember all of their names the first time you watch it. So these short cutaways are essential for us to keep track of who is who, because it's much easier to remember a face than a name. To prove this, let's try something. Look at this scene where I've removed the cutaway. Klaus Fuchs, the British scientist that you put onto the implosion team at Los Alamos, turns out he was, he was spying the Soviets the whole time. Chances are, you can't remember who Klaus Fuchs is. So the scene isn't very satisfying because we don't know who they're talking about. But now, let's look at the actual scene. Klaus Fuchs, the British scientist that you put onto the implosion team at Los Alamos, turns out he was, he was spying the Soviets the whole time. Instantly, with this short cutaway, we know who the spy is because we remember his face. Oppenheimer. 
But these quick edits aren't just used to help us remember characters. Might Mr. Nichols have given him access to the file? They make the abstract scientific concepts seem more dramatic. My own work is so abstract. How do you make discussions about nuclear physics interesting? Well, like this. The bigger the star, the more violent its demise. Again, let's see what it's like if we didn't get these visuals. We compact the atoms together under great pressure to induce a fusion reaction. And now, let's see the actual scene. We compact the atoms together under great pressure to induce a fusion reaction. Then we'll get, not kilotons, but megatons. These cutaways and imagery can also mark when Oppenheimer is most stressed, with some help from the sound design too. When asked about cheating on his wife with Florence Pugh, we hear this. When did you see her after that? When they're talking about making a hydrogen bomb, we hear it again. You, you drown in 10 feet of water or, or 10,000? But this time we cut away to the stamping feet. They're gradually teasing out where the sound is actually coming from. And finally, after they've tested the bomb and Oppenheimer is about to give a speech, we see the source of these sounds. But how do you make it more intense than before? Well, instead of going loud, you go quiet. I just wish we had it in time to use against the Germans. Instead of cutting away to the visuals, you make them part of the actual world. And then in the climax during his interrogation, we get all of these elements combined. A super bomb should never be built! Nolan has always been fascinated by time. Time's gonna change for me. Time is the most cinematic of, of subjects. In Tenet they go back. Time travel. No. In Interstellar they go forwards. A disturbance of space time. And in Dunkirk they kind of switch between timelines. But it's Memento that is most similar to Oppenheimer. We're presented with two timelines. One that starts at the end and goes backwards. It's Leonard. And one that starts at the beginning and goes forwards. One is black and white and one is colour. These colour sequences that are intensely subjective, we alternate with these black and white sequences that, at least to begin with, are objective. These timelines continually intercut and inform each other until they finally converge in the middle, which to us is at the end of the movie. And they meet towards the end of the film. Sound familiar? Well, Oppenheimer essentially has the same structure. If we strip it down, we have two timelines, one from Oppenheimer's perspective and one from Strauss's, one in black and white and one in colour. And I want to use the colour in the black and white to help just make the audience feel the scenes as different. Strauss's timeline begins with his confirmation hearing in 1959 and sort of looks backwards to cover everything that happened after Trinity. These isotopes could be useful to our enemies in the production of atomic weapons. One is a much more objective view of Oppenheimer. You sort of see him from across the room, and perhaps judging him a little more. And Oppenheimer's timeline follows his life up until the Trinity test in 1945. And the other, you're really in his head kind of going on the journey with him. And both of these converge in 1947 with Oppenheimer's conversation with Einstein. The man of the moment. It's in this moment that we not only tie the two timelines together, but it's also a pivotal moment in both characters' journey. We get a final look into Oppenheimer's worldview, helping us understand the true outcome of the first timeline. I believe we did. It also helps us understand Strauss's motivation. I don't know what Oppenheimer said to him that day, but Einstein would even meet my which was the true driving force of everything that came after Trinity. It sees small decisions that add up to make a film that feels unique. It's a three hour movie of people talking about physics and communism, yet it feels like a roller coaster. The editing propels the film forwards, keeping track of what's important. How about because this is the most important fucking thing that ever happened in the history of the world? Yet never getting lost in the small details. I'd love to get more details. At its heart, Oppenheimer is an intimate story about one man. So you're not just self-important, you're actually important. Yet it's constructed as a fast-paced action blockbuster. To be remembered for Trinity. Not Hiroshima. Not Nagasaki. I'm Lawrence, and this has been Archer Green. He should be thanking me. And thank you for watching.